so thank you very much uh, to the workshop organizers for inviting me. So this is um, joint work with Daniele Bigoni, Alessio Spantini, um, who are here uh, this week, as well as our advisor Yusuf Marzouk. And today I'll be talking, um, uh, the talk today will actually follow Alessio's presentation yesterday on nonlinear transformations for Bayesian filtering, but uh, the focus today will be more on the statistical estimation aspects uh, of those transformations. So first, just for some um, uh, motivation and to also set up some of the notation that we'll use. We're um, interested in doing sequential Bayesian inference with uh, nonlinear uh, dynamical models where we have um, the state of a system that we denote by X uh, and this follows some Markov process and then we collect some observations from some likelihood model. And our goal is to characterize the filtering distribution, uh, the distribution for the state of the system at any time T given all the data that we've seen up until that point in time. Uh, and as we know, so there's many challenges uh, for this problem. Uh, some of them include uh, when we have very complex nonlinear phys uh, physics, such as like uh, when we're working with chaotic systems, when we have very sparse observations in both space and time, uh, as well as two challenges that we're uh, like, uh, going to focus on today, which is when we have very high dimensional states. Um, our state X uh, has dimension D often ordered on the order of 10 to the 6, and we're working with very um, limited model evaluations. So uh, often these um, as we know, these uh, results for these types of systems can be uh, found using ensemble common filters where we're working with very small ensemble sizes relative to the dimension of the problem. Okay, so, um, uh, so we mentioned that most of the results are based on ensemble common filters, but we do know that they're uh, inconsistent um, in capturing the posterior distributions, and that's primarily because they're based on finding a linear transformation uh, at every inference step or at every um, assimilation step, which is just a Bayesian uh, inference problem, from the forecast to the analysis or from the prior to the posterior distribution, they derive a linear transformation that um, they apply to every forecast particle in order to get analysis samples. Um, and so one way to at least get a bit closer to, to uh, posterior consistency uh, for these problems is to instead of looking for linear transformations, we could try to find nonlinear maps. Um, and these nonlinear maps we can apply to our forecast to get our um, analysis ensembles. Uh, and so this uh, follows this idea that Alessio introduced yesterday of the stochastic map algorithm. Um, and uh, we'll briefly uh, review this in the next uh, few slides. Now, um, I do want to mention that one thing that makes this problem challenging is that, in fact, we, don't, we only have these um, prior or forecast ensembles and that we need to uh, derive uh, often these very high dimensional uh, nonlinear maps with very few samples. Uh, so the building block to actually derive these transformations is the idea of measured transport. And so uh, I'll briefly review that here. So the idea is if we're, if we're given two densities, uh, pi and eta, eta is often uh, thought of as a simple reference distribution, then what we like to find is some mapping between these densities that allow us to characterize pi via this transformation. Uh, and this coupling exists in, in um, in distributions, what we mean in that sense is that if we do have some samples from our distribution pi that we could call x, then when we apply s to x, uh, uh, we'd like these samples to be distributed according to eta. And so we refer to this as um, that we can uh, think that the push forward of pi through this map s is given by eta. Now there's many ways to find these maps, uh, and we could uh, they're based on a lot of literature on optimal transport, but the ones that we're going to uh, work with today are note Rosenblatt maps, which are maps that have a particular structure in that they're uh, triangular, the nonlinear functions. If we look at the kth component of this nonlinear function, it depends on the, very, the first k variables. Um, and they're, uh, they also have uh, the fact they're monotone with respect to the last variable, in this case, xk for the kth component. And the reason why we want to work with these types of maps for characterizing distributions is that they have a few advantages. The first is that under some conditions on the densities, pi and eta, then these uh, maps are unique. Uh, the second thing is that if we're working with simple reference distributions like ga standard Gaussians, then we could find these maps by solving um, variational problems that minimize some like objective like KL divergence between our target uh, distribution of interest pi and um, our approximation given by this uh, pullback of our reference distribution through this map S. But uh, in fact, this problem can uh, actually be shown to decouple into k convex problems for each of the components of the map. Um, 
And furthermore, the way that we solve this is given some samples from our target pi, then we can approximate this objective using uh, Monte Carlo and then solve this problem for each of our functions, um, each of our map components, SK. Uh, but the third um, advantage of working with tr these triangular maps is that, in fact, they enable conditional sampling. And so what I mean here is that, in fact, each of these components is linked to one of the conditionals in the factorization of this joint density. So we can think of SK as being related to the conditional, the distribution pi of XK given X1 to XK minus 1. Um, and the way that we're going to, uh, we'll, we'll show how we can actually do this type of conditional sampling with uh, an example here. So let's consider the case when we have a density um, w with respect to two sets of variables, Y and X. And we have a reference density, uh, which is a function of Z1 and Z2. Then if we can really find the true coupling between these two densities, then, uh, and it's triangular, then it might have the structure like we have here, where the first set of components depends on Y, and the second, se second set of components depends on Y and X. And if it's a true coupling, then if we have some samples from this joint density pi, uh, as we can see here in the diagram, then if we apply this map to these samples, then we'll get samples from our reference distribution, which we could choose to be a standard normal, for example. Uh, but furthermore, what this also allows us to do is if we do have um, a particular realization of one of our random variables, let's say y, then we could fix um, y to this y star, this particular realization in this map. And uh, this map uh, characterizes the, now the conditional distribution um, x given this particular realization. And so one way to actually sample from that conditional then is to then, um, is to then invert this relation. So given a fixed y star, what we could do is we know that sx of y star uh, and a true sample from the conditional is p uh, pushes forward to a standard normal. So if we invert this relation, if we sample from a standard normal and evaluate it at this inverse map, then we get a sample from the conditional. And furthermore, what this actually allows us to do is then um, think of this uh, c direct coupling actually between this joint density over x and y and this conditional distribution through uh, this reference. And so by composing these maps, we actually do get a map from the joint to the conditional. And so this is actually the basis of the stochastic maps algorithm. So just to uh, uh, review that very quickly. So if we're given some, as an example, at every filtering step, if we're given some forecast samples, x, t of i, and samples, we could um, use our likelihood model to sample some perturbed observations. This gives us a collection of samples from the joint density pi of y and x. And we can estimate the lower triangular map s that actually uh, couples this joint density to a standard Gaussian. Then given the, the uh, lower uh, components of this map, we can compose them in order to generate this transformation uh, that actually maps the joint directly to the conditional um, for a particular realization of y that maps to this posterior distribution. Um, and we could apply this map to each of our forecast samples in order to get some an analysis ensemble. OK, now uh, what we uh, showed or what Alessio showed yesterday is that, in fact, uh, this um, we can do this. And we can, uh, for, for many problems, as an example, certain challenging configurations of the Lorenz 96 problem. And as there, there is actually an advantage to uh, in, um, looking for these maps that actually have certain um, nonlinearities. And what, what we mean is that as we uh, enrich these maps, that they actually do allow us to get closer, in a sense, to um, the posterior distribution up until this, these metrics that we're, we're using to evaluate this. But um, uh, and this is based on enriching the maps with certain uh, additional nonlinearities going from um, red to yellow to purple, cur the purple curve here. But there's a question that remains here, which is, at any given ensemble size, uh, how can we actually construct the best estimator that leverages the information that we have in our forecast ensemble um, and gives us the best trade-off between bias and variance of these nonlinear, uh, of these estimators for these nonlinear functions um, in order to get us the best performance in a sense? And so one way to do that is to uh, try to build uh, estimators for these maps that take advantage of a certain structure in our problem. So one uh, example is, uh, it was recently shown that, in fact, if these um, 
maps are trying to target some density that has some conditional independence structure, then in fact these maps are sparse in the sense that they don't depend on all the input variables um, x1 through xk. Uh, and we can actually empirically look at different problems like the same configuration of the Lorenz 96 system uh, over many uh, assimilation cycles and what we can see is that in fact if we look at the inverse covariance matrix which would encode conditional independence structure if the distributions were really Gaussian. Um, in fact, this matrix is sparse, which gives us some um, indication that there might exist some of this type of structure. Now, what's furthermore challenging is um, if we did have this structure, then we would impose it in these maps and, um, and construct our estimators. But in practice, this structure, uh, we don't know it a priori. And, and furthermore, it does change from iteration to iteration. So trying to learn some or uh, every step of the filtering process, I should say. So it's trying to learn some invariant structure might not often lead to the best estimators. And so what we should try to do is try to learn this structure directly in the maps themselves. Uh, and to show how we'll do that, we'll do this by looking first at just linear transport maps. So in linear maps, uh, what we're looking at is functions S that can be written in terms of a lower triangular matrix L time of, times a vector X. Now these maps, because they're just linear, allow us to only characterize Gaussian distributions where their inverse covariance matrix can be written as LL transpose. Uh, now, if we look at any component of this, of this linear map and we insert it into that optimization problem that we had to learn the, uh, each map component, then we get a problem like we have here. And if we have some samples from pi, then this actually reduces to uh, a simple linear regression problem for um, some normalized coefficients in this map. Uh, component as well as the diagonal. Now, uh, if there does exist some conditional independence in pi, then we, we said that there, this map would be sparse, meaning that it wouldn't depend on all of these variables here. And so this should actually be seen at the parametric level for these parameters. And so if we're actually, if this problem does reduce to linear regression, then one way to uh, extract or, sh or build estimators that do um, in fact, try to take advantage of the fact that many of these betas are sparse uh, is by uh, looking f uh, is by solving uh, what are known as lasso problems that try to add, add L1 penalties to these regression problems uh, and shrink some of the parameters. Now, this idea of uh, looking for uh, sparse um, covariance or inverse covariance matrices in filtering uh, has been looked at in some past work, including one of the presentations that we looked at yesterday. But what we can do now is that because we're learning these nonlinear maps, um, which we can parameterize using some uh, nonlinear basis functions as an example, which should still have this type of structure uh, in terms of sparsity as an example due to conditional dependence, then we could apply the same ideas to uh, learn uh, nonlinear um, maps that can hopefully better characterize some of the non-Gaussianities. Uh, and uh, theoretically, we can say something about these types of maps. So uh, if, we're, um, if we parameterize maps in a certain way and we're dealing with certain types of, of densities, then we can show that the, um, each of the map components can actually characterize the conditional distribution in terms of KL with uh, some error that, that follows this type of scaling. But what's important here is that for this to be bounded, then the number of samples that we should actually need should only grow uh, logarithmically for every component with uh, the dimension of the, of the number of variables in that component, in this case, k. Um, and, in, and by the factorization properties of, uh, of the density, then if we have this type of condition on every conditional, then we get something similar for uh, the joint density in terms of its approximation uh, as the pullback of a reference density through this sparse map. Um, this, of course, being true if we can really approximate this density pi in terms of these sparse maps. And uh, if we don't use these types of estimators, then this is not the same scaling that we would get for the sample size with respect to the dimension of the problem. Uh, and so we can look at how this really performs for learning uh, maps in, um, independently. This is just essentially a density estimation problem. And we could look at the KL divergence of many of uh, some densities as a function of dimension as we increase the problem size for a fixed sample size and look at different types of estimators like trying to learn the maps using uh, no regularization or L2 regularization or L1 and there's definitely an, uh, an improvement at least in terms of KL. 
um, but what's more interesting is that we'd, um, we can use these maps then to, and compose them as we did um, in that stochastic maps algorithm to actually build transformations from prior to posterior and look at how the, what is the effect of regularization in that case. So if we do have, um, uh, we're going to consider a very simple problem where we have a, a prior distribution with some exponential um, covariance, so in this case the precision is sparse, the inverse covariance and local likelihood models, then we could characterize the posterior exactly and we actually can derive all the transformations uh, in close form and we know that they're sparse. And we could look at what is the, uh, how does, um, what is the effect of learning these prior to posterior maps with different types of regularization. But, and here what we're interested in particular is what is the dependence uh, or how accurate of an approximation for the posterior map can we get as we increase the dimension of the problem. Uh, so if we use uh, something like L2, uh, then this would be the dependence on dimension for this particular problem uh, in terms of the posterior uh, approximation error, as well as a covariance tapering, the same way that we that would be performed if we were just applying uh, covariance tapering in ENKFs for this um, for this prior to posterior map, uh, as well as uh, L1 and regularization and what we call an oracle here, which could be considered as possibly the best estimator uh, that we could uh, derive given our um, given a fixed sample size, and it's based on knowing the true sparsity of the problem. And we see that L1 regularization actually for these types of problems that do have this structure actually follow the same type of um, scaling uh, with respect to dimension as these oracle or best uh, estimators. Um, what's actually interesting is that there, uh, when we're dealing with nonlinear maps, there's also the question of how we should best um, uh, derive our analysis, after we derive these transformations, how we should best use them to actually sample from the posterior. And we actually compared different methods. So one being uh, after we derive these maps to just sample from a standard Gaussian and um, uh, push samples through this inverse map to get samples from the posterior, as well as using this um, com composition of these maps. And in fact, the composition does, um, does show an improvement uh, both in terms of magnitude of the posterior approximation and its uh, scaling with respect to dimension. And although this is um, uh, uh, known well for uh, ENKFs, what I'd like to come back to this uh, plot that we showed earlier, which is, uh, which shows this, uh, here this dependence of, um, uh, of the error in a sense on a sample size for different uh, types of no, uh, orders or nonlinearities in these maps that we're estimating. And I'd like to conclude with saying that, um, so in general, what we're interest, interested in is for any given sample size, we'd like to find um, the, the best estimator that we can construct. But the best estimator will depend on, um, um, the best estimator will depend on uh, this bias variance trade-off, uh, the, the, the problem um, uh, parameters, and it's this, this dependence of this, uh, of this, of these choices of um, of how we build these estimators, the regularization that we use, the parameterizations that we use, ultimately just depend. Uh, will have different scalings and depend differently on uh, certain settings of the of the problem. Uh, so in this study, we looked just at how uh, this uh, the the optimal estimators will depend on dimension and how we can. Um, build good estimators in the cases when these maps are truly sparse. Um, but in uh, some future work, ideally, we'd like to extend that to other types of structure um, to actually understand these dependencies better with respect to other problem parameters like the, like the, um, uh, the frequency of observation, the observational noise, um, and, and, and other parameters, um, and ultimately incorporate these more in uh, higher dimensional filtering applications. So uh, I'd just like to thank you for your time and attention and I'd be happy to take any questions.